Hi, everybody. In this lecture, we're going to be examining a related topic to some of the stuff we've been covering in the previous modules. In particular, we're going to start peering into something that we've alluded to numerous times, the individual differences in a lot of the cognitive skills that we've covered. And in doing that, we're going to start tapping into a very controversial, but also kind of alluring topic within the field of psychology called intelligence. When we get into intelligence, we run into a bit of an issue. Oddly, we can talk about individual differences in memory skills, individual differences in attention skills, and other components that we kind of put under the umbrella of cognitive psychology. But when we start to talk about kind of the overarching differences from person to person in these cognitive skills, we start getting into this idea of intelligence. But when we start talking about intelligence, what makes and defines somebody as intelligent sometimes gets a little bit muddled or even controversial. Just to kind of understand what I'm referencing here, I thought we'd start this particular lecture off with a bit of a kind of an insight moment where we spend a minute or two thinking about something that we could use to differentiate between those that are extremely intelligent and the rest of the population. Or we could even spend some time thinking about a multitude of different things, particularly three different things that you could use to separate out people along levels of intelligence. If you've done that, I'm hoping you've started to realize, or at least you've started to quickly run through that in your head, that this task was actually a little bit more challenging than you might have originally thought it would be. This is actually one of the first big hurdles that many people researching intelligence and development slash intelligence ran into. Is how do we even define these variations in cognitive abilities? And we can definitely talk about specific cognitive aspects and people doing better than others on certain things, but when we try to get at this overarching idea of intelligence, kind of having better cognitive facilities overall, what we use to define better becomes a little bit more difficult. So what most people looking at intelligence use to define intelligence is you know, the ability to get to the end product of the thinking process in a little bit better way than others. Essentially, we talk about intelligence being a byproduct of adaptability and problem solving skills. Essentially, if you can get through all the steps and you're doing things right in that information processing model that we talked about earlier, well, then you'll probably come up with better incomes, outcomes and you'd be defined as more intelligent. It's really important to note here that that means that intelligence is not just having a greater memory or being able to pay attention to certain things better. It's very what we call multifaceted. And in fact, even with that broad definition of intelligence, some have argued that things that we link up in our minds with intelligence aren't embedded within that definition. People who come up with not just solutions to problems, but very creative solutions to problems are often in our minds defined as intelligence, but there are very few intelligence tests out there or even calculations out there of mental intelligence that would incorporate creativity into their considerations. Same thing with social skills. We will talk a little bit later about a specific type of intelligence called emotional intelligence, but if we're just talking about people's ability to talk with others and people's ability to kind of maintain a conversation in specific situations, emotional intelligence doesn't really get to it, and definitely the definition of intelligence doesn't really get to that. And we nonetheless tend to tie this with some type of intellectual ability. Memory span might not be the only thing that we tie to intelligence, but it definitely to many of us is an indicator of intelligence. And the same thing goes for the topic that we're going to be discussing in the next module, vocabulary. It might not be a critical component to the information processing steps that we talked about earlier, 
but we nonetheless tend to see it as an indicator of intelligence. So knowing that intelligence is very broad, how do we try to measure it? And Well, what we've seen over the years is a challenge to talk about what intelligence means and then how broad intelligence spans. In the early years of, of the scientific endeavors to understand intelligence, several theorists ran different types of tests and analyses to figure out if they could really kind of encapsulate how much we needed to kind of expand our definition of intelligence to incorporate all the different things that, that could kind of describe individual differences. One of the first big players in this particular approach was a gentleman named Charles Spearman, who looked at a whole multitude of different things that people were using as indicators of intelligence and administered all of these different things to individuals that were willing to participate in the studies. And what he was looking for was whether or not the performance on these different tests and things that people were being looked at on overlapped from person to person. Essentially, he wanted to know if you were high on one test, would you be high on the second test and high on the third and the fourth? And have essentially a very consistent performance, even if the test were theoretically getting at different things. And what Spearman was able to find was that even though there were some subtle differences, usually in performances from test to test, most of us seem to kind of have an underlying factor, or an underlying thing that impacted our performance and kind of pulled us into a certain range. He called this underlying factor the G factor, or general intelligence that people have. And his argument was that if we really wanted to talk about individual differences, could technically get into all the subtle differences across specific areas, or if just academically we wanted to compare people overall on their mental capabilities we could focus in on that g factor just accepting that we miss some of the more important fringe and kind of application based stuff in doing so once he started to look at that g factor he then went down the path of trying to understand exactly what would lead to some of the individual differences that we would find now, Spearman was a huge advocate of avoiding the trap of assuming that heritability was the key component to the G factors. He did not want to get on the boat of arguing that intelligence was inherent and that essentially you were born with a certain level of cognitive capabilities. So instead, most of his work looked at kind of early experiences and interventions that typically shifted people's G factors up or down. One of the things that he focused a lot of attention on was early childhood health and how that could be a big player in the development of our cognitive abilities later in life. But many people, when Spearman started to publish this, did feel kind of uncomfortable with this idea of us having just one thing that defines how intelligent we are, especially with all, again, the different cognitive skills that could potentially be tied to intelligence. And one researcher that started to kind of provide a counter to Spearman's ideas was a gentleman named Robert Sternberg, who started to push his what we call triarchic theory of intelligence. And his argument was that we actually don't just have one thing that's underlying with our intelligence, but three different things that can be completely unique that really should be used to define our intelligence. Now, Sternberg's ideas was, were met with a lot of problems. One of the things that many people often cite with Sternberg is the fact that he was constantly, as he was presenting this idea, shifting the types of intelligence that were a part of this triarchic theory. And one of the reasons why these shifts were often occurring were in his mind because of new discoveries, but also the fact that a lot of the different things that he came up with tended to overlap very highly with each other when they were measured within individuals. So even though he would insist that, you know, you didn't need to be overlapping on all three factors, what he typically found is that if somebody was in the middle on one factor, they were typically in the middle on the second factor and the third factor. And this worked for people on the high end and the low end on all three factors. In fact, he found so many overlaps that some people contended that he sort of accidentally 
just stumbled upon that G factor that Spearman had found before. But it's important to note Sternberg's ideas and contributions because it did continue the conversation down the line where people still insisted that maybe just measuring intelligence on one level or talking about a person's intelligence on just one thing was insufficient. And it eventually led to the work of a, a very famous psychologist named Howard Gardner, who started to publish his theory of what he called multiple intelligences. His argument was that we might indeed have, say, a general intelligence, a G factor, but if we only focus on that, we can't use those intelligence measures for very much. Essentially, if I want to know whether or not you're going to be successful at the school you're at, or if I want to know which job you're more capable of, of succeeding in, knowing your general intelligence is kind of useless. But if I know, say, your kinesthetic abilities, or if I know your arithmetic abilities, or your social skills, or a whole multitude of specific types of intelligence, well, then I might have something that's a little bit more fruitful, something that can give me information about how you'll perform. And Gardner's theory is going to expand on the numbers of intelligences that he thought we should measure over the years. What most people would argue is that over the course of the 20, 30 years since Gardner introduced these ideas, we've seen more utility in his ideas, even if, and this is a big thing, most intelligence measures and most people tend to gravitate back towards the G factor that Spearman talked about many decades ago. And if we're looking for kind of a conclusion on these different definitions of intelligence and how wide we should be, I want us to just appreciate that I don't think any of these individuals necessarily are right or wrong, but it shows the complexity of this topic of intelligence even more. It shows that when we really want to talk about development and intelligence, we've got a lot to tackle because we have to think about how broad we want to define intelligence, whether or not we want to talk about intelligence as being just one overarching thing. And we also have to talk about all the different things that we need to use to define intelligence in the first place it really makes this task a lot different from the other tasks that we've been undergoing previously. So then how do we compare intellectual abilities? Well, to compare intellectual abilities, we do the same thing we did over a hundred years ago. We typically rely on these things called intelligence tests. These are some type of established technique that has been standardized in a way that allows people to compare performances of individuals to each other and get some sense of who's got higher or lower intelligence. Over the years, as you will talk about here, our definition of intelligence tests have been tweaked a little bit, and the types of intelligence tests we use and considerations for these intelligence tests we have have all been updated. But as a whole, intelligence tests have tried to do the same thing overall throughout their entire existence. Find ways to compare individuals across this very challenging, difficult task. got these first intelligence tests started. Well, actually the person credited with the development of the first really universally used intelligence test was somebody that sort of had the need to develop this thrust upon him. It's a very famous psychologist in our history named Alfred Binet, who was working for the French Ministry of Education in the early 1900s. He, with one of his colleagues named Theodore Simon, was given kind of an unusual task that required him to really develop this first intelligence test. The French government had essentially decided that there were a number of children within their school systems that were struggling mightily and potentially holding back a lot of the other kids within the school system. So they asked Benet and his colleague Simon to find a way to detect these children, to find some means of determining who was going to have really challenging intellectual capabilities that could cause problems for the schools. 
So Binet came up with a series of different questions and tasks that he asked, not of large numbers of children, but just younger children. Uh, and he, by testing, and I think it was 10 children of different ages that he considered average in their performance, he was able to get a sense of this thing that he called a mental age of children. He essentially would ask kids questions like point to your toes or you know, touch your head or can you count to 10? Uh, and, and he would get to slightly more elaborate stuff like defining terms like to say justice, some terms that maybe kids hadn't heard that often. But his main focus was just on looking at very young children. Usually it was kids somewhere between the ages of two to, I think his cap was seven, if I recall correctly, and just look at what their performance would be like. And then he would go out into the community and test children based on their either kind of concerns about the child or the potential that the child might need a little bit of help so he could determine if the child's performance matched their actual age. So he started to compare the child's mental age to their chronological age. He wasn't necessarily interested in looking at kids that were doing exceptionally well. That wasn't the point of his tests. And he wasn't necessarily looking at a wide range of ages. But his test, when it started to get developed, was really celebrated by the intellectual community as an indicator of what we could do with these cognitive tests. Now, many people took Binet's work and brought it in a very different path than Binet had originally intended it to be. But you know, to understand how we got from Binet to where we are now, we first have to, have to kind of look at what happened after Binet started to introduce these tests and they started to become widely distributed, not just across the uh, France, sorry, but and not even just across Europe, but across numerous countries throughout the world. Once Binet started publishing and working with his tests, and him and Simon used these to start to develop school assessments and specific programs that could be designed to help children that were struggling in their academic settings, others took this information and, and brought it into a completely different world. One of the things that early intelligence tests started to get wrapped up in was this movement that had actually started a number of years before Binet's tests called the eugenics movement, something that was championed by the gentleman pictured over here on the left-hand side, Sir Francis Galton, who had already started numerous studies trying to show that head sizes of specific races and specific cultures were smaller or less, so he said, were developed, less developed than other cultures. Essentially, he was trying to show that there was some type of superior race and superior group of individuals, and that if we wanted humankind to maximize its potential, we needed to find a way to do away with all the inferior groups and just push, prop up the groups that he considered superior, or at least he was trying to prove were superior through some of his nonsensical tests that he had devised. When he saw intelligence tests and others saw intelligence tests starting to be developed, they grabbed onto this and argued that this would be a great way of showing that essentially we were inherently, I guess, given our intellectual capabilities. This brings us back to the idea of heritability. Galton and many others contended that this was almost an entirely nature-based thing where what we were born with was what we were guaranteed to have throughout our life in terms of our ability to memorize things and pro solve problems and understand what was going on in our lives. But when Galton and others started to try to grab on to tests like Binet's to do these individual comparisons, they quickly realized that Binet's test was completely insufficient for these goals. Because again, Binet had no interest in looking at mentally superior individuals. He had no intentions of trying to show why certain people were struggling versus others or excelling versus others. He was simply doing his job that 
the French Ministry of Education had asked him to do, to come up with a test to kind of flag kids that were struggling. And he took his work as an indicator that he could he could try to develop some type of program to help these children. But unfortunately, even though Benet's work was pretty benevolent, uh, lots of individuals to, took the path of Galton's and started to really try to find ways to use these early intelligence tests as a way of comparing people and trying to show who was superior. One of the champions of this idea of trying to show superiority was a gentleman that was actually at Stanford in the early 1900s named Lewis Terman, who was also a huge advocate of this eugenics movement and was insistent that if he wanted to, well, actually if we wanted to be a superior country in the United States, we would need to find ways to really flag individuals that were superior and encourage them to have as many offspring as possible while also flagging those that were considered inferior and ensuring that they did not get to pass on their genetics. Again, kind of the insistence that <clears throat> what we're looking at with intelligence is something that is inherent, something that's entirely heritable. So Terman created this new test that diversified the types of things being measured and became much more complex so we could look at not only a wider range of performances, but also wider ranges of ages. And he called this test the Stanford Binet IQ test. It was actually developed in 1916, but surprisingly enough, it's still in circulation today. We've got lots of different revisions of it and lots of tweaks to get at different cognitive skills. Uh, but if, if we are looking at this from a slightly unbiased perspective, it is probably worth noting that the Stanford Binet IQ test was much broader and did incorporate a lot more cognitive skills than the original Binet-Simon test. Uh, if we're looking at other things that he contributed to this, uh, there were some kind of interesting caveats that are worth mentioning. He was one of the first people to start talking with his tests about this thing that we nowadays just kind of use interchangeably with intelligence, this idea of something called IQ or the intelligence quotient. Now, when Terman used this concept, he didn't actually develop it necessarily on his own. There was another theorist named Stern that had developed the quotient a little bit before him, but Terman used this intelligence quotient formula in his IQ test. And in this formula, what you needed to do was just do a basic math problem to understand how intellectually capable a person was. You would take a person's mental age, which was still based on the performance on the task, divide that mental age by chronological age, and multiply that ratio by 100. So essentially, if somebody was performing like they should at their age, they would have an IQ score of around 100. If they were performing below people their own age, they would have an IQ score that was obviously less than 100. And if people were performing like older individuals, then they would have an IQ score above 100. This might seem like a relatively straightforward thing, but if any of you have a math background, you can realize pretty quickly that this formula is riddled with problems. Essentially, you're going to have wild swings in intelligence at young ages because the ratios of numbers are much more extreme. And when you get to older ages, pretty much everybody's going to have an IQ of around 100 because, well, one, we don't change that much as we get older. And two, if we're dividing, say, 75 by 70, that's not going to have much of an impact, even if you are performing at a level slightly above your peers. Now, never mind the curved nature of a lot of the different cognitive tasks that we're looking at. And nonetheless, this IQ idea started to persist. People started to kind of celebrate it. And Terman became famous and popular, and lots of people like Alfred Binet probably groaned, thinking that this was where intelligence tests had now developed into. Not that the intelligence tests becoming more diversified and complex were a big problem, but because now people in the early 1900s were really relying a lot on heritability and intelligence tests to prove that there were some type of group within, say, a population 
that was superior to others. Again, just to highlight Binet's insistence that this was probably a bad idea, I put a quote on this slide of showing that Binet was strongly against the use of his intelligence tests for these means. For a while, what many people did with intelligence tests was kind of use them to compare individuals and groups. But as time progressed, we started to recognize that there were lots of inherent flaws with the Stanford Binet tests. Now, it's probably important to note that over the years, the Stanford Binet test did try to address some of the inherent problems with cultural issues, language issues, and other concerns that popped up with some of the questions that were being asked. But many individuals started to contend in the 1950s and 60s that essentially the Stanford Binet test was inherently flawed, primarily because of where it was designed and why it was designed. So people started looking for alternatives. One of the alternatives that started to emerge was this collection of tests that we nowadays call the Wechsler scales, developed by the famous psychometrician David Wechsler. Wechsler decided to, when trying to compare intellectual abilities of individuals, and to make his tests even broader than the Stanford Binet tests, and kind of focus on the academic side of things, not the social cultural side of things. So one of the first things Wexler decided to do with his tests to make them a little bit more fine-tuned and focus on specific types of intellectual capabilities was he broke up his test into two different types, what was called the WACE and the WISC. Essentially, he contended that a lot of the questions asked in the Stanford Binet tests in the beginning were sort of meaningless once you became, say, a teenager or beyond, because the questions were ridiculously easy. Now he said, let's do away with that where we can't see lots of individual differences, and let's focus our tests on, for adults on more challenging things. And in doing so, he thought he could be do better comparisons, again, across a wider range of specific skills. For children, he broadened the test and added more nuances to it to, again, allow for a greater comparison across a wide range of cognitive skills. And in his test, he did still use the general idea of kind of having an overall intelligence score. But he really, in his tests, wanted to focus on performance within each area. And to talk about performance within each area in a slightly more logical way, he did away with the basic intelligence quotient and started to use something called a normalized curve. Um, technically, it was a forced normalized curve to compare people's abilities across a wide range of these skills. So what that meant was, essentially, if you performed on average with your peers, you'd still get a score of 100. But if you were performing better than your peers with this new test, you wouldn't look for what age group you were most like, which again started to become sort of nonsensical in the extremes. Instead, what you would do is just look at what percentage of your peers you were doing better than. And based on the percentage of people you would be doing better than, you would get an IQ score that was higher or lower than 100. This idea makes intuitive sense, but it's probably important to note that for this to work, to talk about percentiles that you're performing better on in these tests, you do have to do something called forcing a normal curve. What that means is that if we're looking at the average performance on these intelligence tests, most of us do actually pretty well on a large number of these tests. And people doing better on these tests tend to only do better in small, subtle ways. So essentially, if you're scoring really high on an intelligence test on a Wechsler scale, you're probably only performing just a little bit better than your peers. Because again, everybody's doing pretty well on these tests. But if you score really low on an intelligence test through these Wechsler scales, well, then you're probably doing significantly worse than other people performing on these tests because the, the, the distribution of people doing slightly below average is, is much wider in terms of performances. So what, what we kind of get in this situation is uh, outcomes where subtle differences mean a lot on the upper end, 
and mean almost nothing on the lower end of the normal distribution. It's kind of tough sometimes to follow, but, but essentially understand that it gives us this impression that there's a bell curve in terms of people's intellectual capabilities in the world. In reality, it's more of a negatively skewed distribution. If we're also looking for other big things that came from these tests, it was that Wexler tried to do his best to do away with some of the cultural and language-based concerns that people had with the Stanford Binet tests. Uh, one of the classic examples of a test that he not necessarily devised, but utilized in these Wexler scales, is something called the block test, where you see different blocks placed in front of you and you're asked to recreate different combinations of you know, shapes or, or images. These types of tests theoretically didn't require language skills and didn't require lots of the, the kind of prior knowledge that the Stanford Binet tests and even some of the Binet and Simon tests required of people participating in them. There's still probably some issues with these tests, but most people argued that the Wexler scales were a giant step in the right direction. And in fact, most clinical psychologists today use the Wexler scales when looking at the intellectual abilities of the people that they're talking with. Because not only can it give us a slightly less biased perception of things, but it can really tap into specific skills a lot better than some of the other tests that have been devised in the past. It's important to note that even as we move on to slightly more unbiased, slightly more accepted types of tests, there are some inherent assumptions within these tests that many people still feel uncomfortable with. One of the things that tends to really make people not embrace these tests fully in the cognitive world is that these tests are, well, tests. And sometimes when we look at problem solving skills and mental capabilities, it's nearly impossible to encapsulate somebody's cognitive abilities or information processing skills if we go back to what we're talking about in some type of written tests. And it also leads us back to another kind of odd assumption, and that's that we should be pre somehow, all of us, kind of projecting or developing in a very predictable manner in terms of our performance on these tests. The, the Stanford Binet test you know, assumed that seven-year-olds should all be getting certain questions right and 10-year-olds should be getting other questions right. But you know, when we can look at individual differences and take into account cultural differences, this assumption that there's this obvious predictable pattern for everybody in terms of what we learn and when might not make perfect sense. And this idea that you know, you're going to get these questions right, which is kind of the inevitable outcome of this, at certain points is also kind of standing on very shaky ground. This shaky ground is what we're going to stand on for now. Please understand, there's a lot more to get to. There's a lot more to parse out and break down and dispute. I know some of you might be a little uncomfortable with what we've gone over so far in intelligence tests, but I promise that there's a big kind of conclusion to this that I want you to make sure that you go over. Because right now we've laid the framework of what's going on with intelligence tests, how we use them, and we've sort of alluded to some potential concerns that could pop up with respect to culture and different experiences. In our next lecture, we're going to start breaking down specific types of intelligence, trying to tie that into developmental psychology, and we're going to be revisiting this heritability debate, the topic that's often intertwined with intelligence, we're looking at the link between developmental psychology and intelligence. In that class, we're going to be also considering a lot of things that I've kind of been hedging on and alluding to here in this video. So hopefully you have enough time to digest all of this, go over the slides, go over the readings, and we'll close up with this topic of intelligence and development in our next lecture. Until then, take care.